All right, thank you very much. We've organized a panel here to, to look at the role of the private sector in delivering green growth. Um, and the objective of the panel is to analyze how business can profit from sustainable practices and to assess the potential for private sector to lead the way in promoting sustainable investments. The discussion is an opportunity for panelists to contribute to some of the final outcomes of, of the, the, this summit. And we, we look for outcomes with respect to sustainable landscapes, with respect to um, su supporting research, to supporting investments, and continued multi-stakeholder dialogues around sustainable landscapes. Okay. I'd like to introduce the, the, the panelists for this afternoon. We have Ada Greenberry, who's the Managing Director for Sustainability and Stakeholder Engagement at Asia Pulp and Paper. We have Ben Ridley, who is the Head of Sustainability Affairs for Asia Pacific Credit Suisse. We have Glenn Hurwitz, sitting next to him, who's Managing Director for Climate Advisors. We have Mauricio Amore, who's the Executive Director for Monsanto, Indonesia. We have Tina Lawton, who's the Regional Director for Syngenta, Asia Pacific. And finally, Felia Salim, who's the Vice President uh, uh, and Director of, of uh, BNI here in, in Indonesia. Um, and so what I'm going to do is, is ask each one of the, the panelists to, to give us a, a, a two or three minute introduction to what their, their com company is doing in, in, with respect to um, uh, delivering green growth and, and, and how that relates to, to the, uh, the landscapes and, and land use sector. Um, and then we'll go into a, a question and answer uh, period and then open the, the floor for discussion. Okay, so Ada, if you'd like to. Yeah, just get it. Sure. Thank you, Louis. Um, the, the, the session uh, now could not be more of a topical subject for myself and also for Asia Pulp and Paper Group, where I'm working for. I'm sure you all know about uh, our zero deforestation policy that we announced uh, in February last year. And just last week, uh, we also announced a very far-reaching and ambitious forest conservation and restoration initiative to be attempted by any company, as far as I know. Uh, one million hectares of forest, con forest protection and restoration initiative in Sumatra and in Kalimantan in Indonesia. To put this into context, uh, this, is an, this is an area of over 13 times the size of Jakarta. So how is this relevant to our topic today about green growth? To this, I would say that the private sector has to be the key driver, the catalyst, if you like, of green growth. There are several reasons why I think this is so. It can move quicker than some other stakeholders. It has landscapes in its supply chain. It has manpower and it has capital to invest, including in the capacity building. But above all, it has an incentive. And what is that incentive? Mainly, it is the other private sector players further down the supply chain. Those who apply pressure through their green procurement policies, who see forest conservation as an absolute prerequisite of doing business, and whose consumers demand it. The role of the consumers cannot be underestimated here. The consumer plays a very big role in reshaping the supply chains. But the private sector cannot be the only participant. Its role may well to be the kickstart of things, but beyond that it must work with the governments and other stakeholders to bring together of all various players whose skills are needed and whose interest must be served if profitable enterprise is to sit comfortably alongside the sustainable forest management and habitat conservation. Government, conservation NGOs, civil society, communities, scientists, managers, finance experts, all these and more are, are needed to sit around the table. I read that the key outcomes that you seek from these sessions are the endorsement of the landscape approach and commitments on sustainable landscape research, investment in them, and multi-stakeholder dialogue. I've been talking about landscape approach for over a year by now, and we have been designing our sustainability strategy based on landscape approach. I can tell you that the first one, the landscape approach, is an absolute for us. This is at the heart of our forest conservation policy and the one million hectare restoration pledge. It cannot be done without the whole landscape approach. Land cannot be effectively protected or restored in isolation because neighboring areas have a significant impact on any given concession. 
And this cannot be done without knowledge, research, and understanding of the incredibly complex functioning of forest. We have moved a long way already in this with my company, Asia Pulp and Paper, but there is a lot more to do. And yes, it costs money. I'm not in the position right now to give you the precise figure, but believe me, it's not cheap. Having said that, it is an investment in the real sense of the word because of the anticipated return. The return takes the form of the long-term protection of our own investment in pulpwood plantations. Also, we want to continue to produce paper in, in, in 50 or 100 years' time, but unless we do solve the problem of deforestation now, then this will not be possible. There is no greater incentive than that. The market's role is to recognize and reward those businesses that take ambitious steps in this direction. This has an additional benefit that, in that it encourages others to join in. This is effective competition. And that is what green growth is really all about for us. Achieving a financial return on investment at the same time as achieving a return on investment for the environment and in particular, the natural asset that is our forests. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I'd like to give the floor to, to Ben Ridley. Thank you. Yeah, you, you, can, you can do it yeah. here. It's fine. If, if you can hear me. I, I feel a little bit like Madonna. <laughs> I'm not sure if I, if I look like Madonna or not, but is that better? Go, yeah, OK. Mark's, Mark's my senior in the business, so he's uh, <laughs> pulling me in line. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, very warm welcome to you. There's just a few things that I would, I would mention. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with banking. Um, I joined Credit Suisse about five years ago from an environmental consulting background. And you know, banks are, banks are very large organisms, very large ecosystems. Our own operational footprint is really relatively straightforward. It's our energy consumption, it's our paper consumption. Um, so we take care of those aspects. I think where banks are seen as being impactful is indirectly through the activities of our clients. And there are three areas where I think we, we do have an impact, where we can have a, a positive impact. Mark has already touched upon these as well. One is on the dialogue side. Um, we work down and across just about every supply chain on the planet as an industry, not necessarily Credit Suisse, but we are, we are everywhere, We're kind of omnipresent in a sense. Um, give you an example in terms of the dialogue, we were involved with RSPO, very particular to, uh, to this, uh, this topic and this summit. Um, we became members a few years ago because uh, we'd like to be engaged in the dialogue. We think that is a very important dialogue to have. Um, it's a good opportunity for us to meet and understand broader stakeholder expectations from the NGO community. We know that these issues are important for our clients in the oil palm sector. So the dialogue is one piece. Uh, the other area is research. Um, just do a little pitch for this. We, we do research into all sorts of topics. This is a, a private sector conservation finance paper that we produced earlier this year. Um, this is one example. It's, it's something which you know, I'd encourage you to look at. We did have some hard copies. We do have soft copies on the internet, so you can download uh, and get a feel for the size of the private sector market opportunity in the space of conservation finance. Um, and ultimately, in terms of products and services for our clients, um, the idea would be that something of this nature, this kind of research, would lead to a financial product, conservation finance product. These are some of the things that we are working on. Um, we have all sorts of responsible investment products and services in the bank, microfinance, uh, we are involved in green bond initiatives. Um, so, you know, th there's, there's an awful lot that banks do and can do. So I just leave those with some opening remarks. Thank you. Next, I'd like to give the floor to Glenn Hurwitz. It's great to be here. Um, I, uh, I, I work with Climate Advisors just by way of introduction. We are a mission-driven consulting organization. Uh, we work with governments, nonprofits, and philanthropies uh, to deliver the low-carbon economy. Uh, a major portion of our work focuses on transforming uh, the world's uh, agricultural and commodity markets to break the link between agricultural production and deforestation. 
And within a Southeast Asian context, uh, I like to think of our work as how we can drive the creation of what we call green tiger economies. Um, these are economies in which conservation of forests and other natural resources uh, actually drives growth uh, for countries like Indonesia and Malaysia um, that have historically uh, seen very high levels of deforestation uh, and attendant pollution and other degradation of natural resources. Um, we think that this region is really at a, a moment of truth right now. Um, and there's both environmental reasons for that, but also really powerful economic reasons. Um, we look at what has happened in Brazil at a re as a real model, where uh, civil society around the world drove uh, major agricultural traders uh, to demand that producers change the way they do business, so that they were producing agricultural commodities on a large scale without any deforestation. That led to a 75% decline in deforestation. And now global consumer companies, global financiers, are increasingly looking at Brazil as a responsible option for investment. That has the potential to put Southeast Asian economies at a real disadvantage. If Southeast Asia is associated with deforestation, peatland clearance, and human rights abuse, it's going to be hard to compete. The good news, uh, and this is something that we've been involved in, is that increasingly private sector companies in Southeast Asia are actually stepping up and leading the way uh, towards no deforestation, no peat, and no exploitation production. Uh, it's been incredibly exciting to see companies like Golden Agri Resources, uh, Asia Pulp and Paper, and, and one that we've been very involved with, Wilmar International, really take the lead to adopt comprehensive policies. In the case of Wilmar, you've, their company that controls 45% of the global palm oil trade. Uh, they're also a major soybean importer into China and uh, one of the world's biggest sugar companies. You can either you know, be a green tiger and compete in the global marketplace, or you can get cut off from market access and access to capital. And these are the rules that I think are going to define uh, the region's economy as we go forward. Thank you. Mauricio? Mauricio Horowitz? Oh, uh, Mercer, oh, Mercer. It's okay, you don't worry. Okay, so good afternoon. I'm Mauricio Amore, and I represent Monsanto. And uh, just uh, grateful to be here and thankful that we have the opportunity to share a little bit about uh, what we're trying to do to uh, help sustainability and deforestation as well. So Monsanto is a um, sustainable agricultural innovation company. And uh, our main objective is to uh, produce more, conserve more, and uh, get a better level of life to our farmers. We uh, put a significant amount of effort in working for farmers and ensuring that all the research and development that we do on a regular basis is focused on these three things. And uh, when we're talking about conserving more and producing more, really it's all about helping farmers yield more in the same plot. Uh, we're probably all aware that uh, to reduce deforestation, one of the things we need to do is we need to ensure that on the current level of lands of agriculture that we have today, we need to produce more because uh, there's a significant amount of more people in the world day by day. And uh, we do that through innovation, technology, and obviously, as well as partnerships with other stakeholders that can help us bring these uh, new tools to farmers. Um, we uh, also committed to partnering. We can, we're very aware that uh, our technologies will help the farmers, but uh, we're also aware with that uh, we cannot do it alone. So we need to partner with uh, different stakeholders around the world to help ensure that farmers in every space get uh, access to these technologies and are able to learn from them and implement. And um, those partnerships are key in delivering and being able to show how uh, our, uh, these technologies reduce the carbon footprint. So that's pretty much what Monsanto is working on and what we're doing. And uh, we're, I think we, any questions that will come in the panel right away, we can answer. Thanks. Thank you. Next, I'd like to give the floor to, to Tina Lawton.
First of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to um, share a few thoughts with you today. Um, in order to do so, I'd like to reflect on this beautiful picture behind me um, to perhaps exemplify the collective challenge before us. To grow more food using fewer resources whilst protecting nature and improving the livelihoods of rural communities is in fact our collective challenge. Today we have heard from many advocates who see the need and believe in the requirement to balance the need for increasing productivity as well as enabling preservation through sustainable practices that raise the livelihoods of rural communities. Green growth to Syngenta means being able to achieve sustainable increases in agricultural productivity, and we believe that the private sector, both as a contributor and a collaborator, has a key role to play. Our philosophy is best depicted through our Good Growth Plan, where we have made six commitments in a real difference that as we approach these challenges, we as Syngenta will make, together with our partners, to the year 2020. The three that I would like to highlight today are the following. The first is around empowering smallholders, raising the productivity by at least half of 20 million smallholders between today and 2020. The second, again a theme that has resonated today, is around sustainable improvement in biodiversity, particularly reclaiming land on the brink of degradation to the order of 10 million hectares. The third commitment I would like to highlight is around making crops 20% more efficient, but whilst using less land and our resources far more efficiently. Green is not about stopping agriculture. Green growth is about sustainable agriculture, using resources more efficiently through investment, modern technologies, and knowledge transfer. And it can be done effectively only by looking across the value chain and seeing private government and non-government organizations working together to make a real difference. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'd like to now invite Felia Salim to make her comments. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to share with you Bangnagara Indonesia's challenges and actually opportunities. Um, it's been a ro long road to arrive to the stage where we can pride ourselves as um, showing our commitment about sustainability. Obviously, it took us more than almost a decade to have uh, measures that we can introduce and mainstream into the bank, starting with signing up for UNEP FI some eight years ago. Uh, we now have um, in our system some measures with regards to environmental and social risk assessment criteria that is mainstream in the way we look at and assess credit. So we have that internally. And we take that very seriously and train all our account officers to look at the credit process in addition to the standard credit process. We have the environmental and social risk assessment criteria. But we all also look at the other measures that is available. And what are the um, implementing regulation, if at all, available, industry by industry? We are very much industry-focused, and 
industries such as in the agribusiness, in forestry, in energy, they all have, to a, an extent, significant guidelines. Whether or not they're being effectively implemented to date, that still needs to be assessed further. However, it has given us a clear guideline for our officers. Of course, we would like to see a more uh, quantifiable roadmap when we talk about reducing carbon emission. The number of 26% has been in the back of our mind, or 41% with international cooperation to reduce it. But I have yet to see a quantifiable, not necessarily precise, a range where we both, in this forum specifically, can say that we are progressing. I'm still wondering wh where those joint agreement um, to reduce the carbon emission. We have a lot of tools, how-tos, a lot of industry players now assisting in advising, auditing, but yet I'm still lacking, uh, I'm still wondering um, a common vision, a, com a commitment of what are those targets should be in the next five years, let's say. But even without those clear, clearly defined agreements on how many, how much we should be reducing, we still are in the business of risk mitigation and not risk avoidance because the green economy, sustainability measures, it's mainstream, it's a mainstream idea. It's, we don't have to be convinced. We are completely convinced that for the long-term sustainability of business, sustainability criteria makes a lot of business sense. Therefore, we're taking the environmental self-risk assessment very seriously. And then we also, we also now um, are closely watching what the uh, Men Elha, the environmental ministry, they have come up with proper and yet another tool of rating system since 2010, I believe. Today there's, as I understand in Indonesia, about 1,500 companies that sign up for proper, a testing ground to learn about how to implement sustainable, sustainability into their operation. From those 1,500, a significant number are, in fact, our client base, and I'm happy to see that there are improvements from 2011. From 72% that has passed at least the blue and green, it has now increased to 92% that complies. So those perhaps are already those willing, uh, those 1,500 are those companies that are serious. So it is quite possible. And in fact, they are the, the most profitable companies that we finance. But these are mostly the large companies. The question is always about the cost. The cost to implement all these sustainability measures, having independent assessments, having auditors to assist in, the, in this drive. Therefore, I would like to seek participants, players, and perhaps also government policies to incentivize some of the other segments, not the large corporations, but the medium to small. I'm very encouraged also that some of the global supply chain drivers, the likes of Unilever and the companies you mentioned earlier, are also driving all the other segments in the same direction. But very often, these uh, small to medium-sized businesses are left to their own, are left to the market. Hence, it's a very slow progress. Countries like Indonesia, a very decentralized government, 
has its institutional challenges in the regions. This is something that, as bankers, we note very carefully, because most of our forestry or agribusiness that we finance are all in the regions. In Palm oil, for example, are they RSPO? Have they met the RSPO or they, they, met, they, they meet the ISPO? From the Indonesian standpoint, ISPO is going to become a requirement, whereas RSPO is left voluntary. Let it let market decide. Perhaps to strike a little bit of both helps, making it somewhat a requirement, but assisting them to grow accordingly. That is perhaps not the role of a bank. We are intermediaries, but we can certainly play a significant role in pushing this process. Because, as I said earlier, it does make economic sense. When it's a lot simpler to work with the large companies, our challenge internally is to implement the environmental self-risk assessment for the small and medium-sized businesses. For the small businesses, for example, we have the corporate community responsibility guidelines. Embedded in it are sustainability measures, and so forth and so forth. Assisting the, co the companies going up the value chain ladder, which includes a learning process to improve in their sustainability criteria, so that their businesses is a profitable and sustainable one. These are just some of the points I would like to raise. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. So I'd like to follow up on, on, on some of these ideas and, and maybe perhaps begin with you, Ada, on, on um, the, the, your, your company has made some significant commitments to um, uh, stopping deforestation, to, to rehabilitating degraded lands. Um, you have a lot of support from, from the international NGO community. Um, it's seen as an example uh, in the industry. So I'd like to ask you a bit, I mean, we, across Indonesia, there, there's been a deficit in planting area. And, and um, there were, in 2008, there were already 5 million cubic meter shortfall in, in wood supply to meet mill needs. And that, that uh, is expected to grow with increasing demand and with increasing mill capacity in, in the country um, to, to about 30 million cubic meters a year. You're also, the, across the industry, um, the, the plantations are suffering challenges associated with, with pests and diseases. You have uh, um, problems with the acacia mangium, uh, problems with acacia crassicarpa. Um, plantations are being harvested early. Can, can the industry can meet, the, can, can your company meet demands and can we expect the industry to meet demands from plantations? What can be done to, to improve the sustainability? Or is it going to, to, to bring into question your ability to, to, to meet your targets? Um, and and what, what are you doing about it? What lessons are you learning that could be applied to your own company but also applied more widely across the industry to ensure that, that supply to the mills is meeting the demand of, of the mills? There's uh, a lot of questions. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember what you asked. Uh, th but the short answer... Can your supply meet your demand? <laughs> and how but, sustainable is it? Yeah, yeah. Are you going to meet your sustainability requirements? Yeah, the, the short answer about... Uh, the short answer about how to increase our... Uh, productivity and, and meeting the demand is basically lays on the, lies on the technology and, and the science and how we improve our silviculture uh, uh, in, uh, in the ground. Um, you're absolutely correct that uh, uh, global paper demand actually increased by 2.1% every year, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So the, the, the global paper demand right now is about 392 million tons per annum and um, by next year it's going to be 490 or something like that or um, so it's a huge uh, huge increase uh, by 2.1 percent uh, every year so how, how how are you how are we going to do it uh, sorry uh, 490 by 2020 it's it's no coincidence that uh, that we launched our sustainability roadmap 2020 in 2012 before we launched our zero deforestation policy because we need we need we need to really um, map out our plan on how to be truly sustainable by 2020 uh, by truly uh, reliable on a sustainable plantation as raw material um, in fact just a couple of weeks ago we processed the last 
block from natural forests in our supply chains, which, uh, which our supplier fell before February 2013. The last natural forest lock. That is, we're not going to process any more natural forest lock. Um, so we are very confident in meeting the 2020 demand of 490 million ton by uh, uh, following our sustainable roadmap. And also, uh, we have engaged quite a lot of uh, independent assessors, experts in growth and yield, and also plantation experts to measure whether uh, we have enough yield, uh, growth and yield or not in, in our plantations, in our suppliers' plantations. Um, that we, we found that we still have potential for a very substant substantial yield increase as well. We see the potential to increase the mean annual increment, so it's basically an a increment of how many ton uh, per hectare per year plantation actually create. Also, we, uh, there we see opportunity to reduce wood loss. We also opportunity to improve the pulping technology to make it uh, more efficient of uh, optimizing the fiber use. Um, and also, we see an opportunity to, to also mentor other suppliers, as you probably aware that, that we do have our own concessions versus uh, uh, independent concessions. So we use this opportunity to share knowledge, to share uh, management knowledge and also silviculture knowledge, as well as um, uh, uh, mentoring their performance to make sure that their performance is at par with our own policy and also our own concession. As far as disease control, this goes really well with our zero deforestation and restoration policy. Um, we are using uh, uh, um, natural forest corridors and buffer zones to make sure that uh, we can control disease outbreaks. Um, we use them as, as the buffer to, to stop the disease outbreaks to go to the next plantation. And secondly, we also rely on more than one species. We actually now have three species in our plantations, so Acacia crassicapa, Acacia mangium, and Eucalyptus pellita for mo for, from so many different variants. So then we can uh, uh, further mitigate the risk for, um, for uh, disease. And uh, you're probably aware that part of our zero deforestation commitment, we also pledge to uh, protect forested peatland and also sustainable peatland management. Again, it's also part of the uh, uh, strategy to mitigate uh, forest fire as well in the future, thus uh, in, uh, protecting our investment in, in our plantation. So, um, um, my, in a nutshell, uh, my answer is basically, increasing productivity uh, to meet the global paper demand will only work if we also implement zero deforestation policy and also our further plan to restore. The three of us can, are very, incredibly very linked to each other, but in, to a certain extent, extent also uh, quite dependent from each other. So that's a nutshell of my answer okay. to your question. But, but the, the point was that your productivity is actually decreasing because you're harvesting your plantations at three or four years instead of seven years. So you're not getting the wood yield out of your plantations. So if you're having a productivity decrease, how are you going to meet the increasing demand? No, actually we're harvesting our plantation right now on average uh, with, uh, based on five years uh, rotation, not three to four years. Even on, on the peatlands with, with the, the root rot problem? Yeah, uh, root rot is actually affecting acacia uh, mangium, not so much on the, on the peatland. So um, we, we are still sticking on the five years uh, rotation harvest. Uh -oh. you, should, you should visit our plantations. Yeah, yeah. be happy to. Okay. okay, thank you very much. I'd um, like to, to um, maybe ask uh, uh, Ben some, some questions about um, uh, some of the, 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 um, the international investment uh, dimension of things. You know, international investments are driving part of the, the, the land conversion that we see here in Southeast Asia. Um, and so I'd like to ask, what are, the, what are the safeguards that you put into your investment policy? What, what sort of due diligence do you do? Could you, could you describe a bit the procedures that you go through? Um, uh, how do you verify? If you're doing some due yeah. diligence ahead of time, how do you verify that the companies are sticking to their business plans and, and sure. meeting their commitments? And if you run into a problem, what do you do about it? Okay. Thanks very much for the questions. Um, so we've had a global forestry and agribusiness policy in place at Credit Suisse for uh, five years, thereabouts. It sets really the framework of our commitments. It's very complementary as well to our reputational risk policy, which is a bit more of an umbrella risk management policy. Um, 
and more importantly, I think, than any policy is the mechanisms which underpin it and the capacity, the human capacity, the, the systems, the procedures. So in terms of the referral process internally, first of all, we have a number of gatekeeper functions. So we have um, client ID, we have other KYC, know your customer functions, we have people in credit risk, uh, we have you know, a, a plethora of different control gatekeeper functions within the organization. And at the point of a particular transaction or relationship, they will, they will catch this and they'll refer it across to the sustainability desk. Uh, we will look at a transaction you know, via, via the requirements of a forestry policy. So you know, it, it, it's a bit of a dry matter, but you can look on our website if you really want to know what's, what's in our forestry policy. Uh, but no conversion of high conservation value forest. That includes all primary forest. Um, our sort of oil palm position is consistent with the PNC of RSPO. Um, we do initial screening. And an important point to mention here is that a lot of the business that we do is repeat business. So, you know, we, we don't often get into situations with a client around which we don't already have quite a portfolio of information. So we do due diligence through an initial screening. Uh, we use Swiss-based service provider rep risk. Uh, we use other tools, MSCI screening, just, just to get an idea. It doesn't make us lead to a decision as to levels of comfort with a particular transaction at that point gives us an indication. And we also know very much for emerging market economies, the absence of information, it doesn't mean that there's no issues, it just means there's no information. So we also maintain relationships with NGOs and to the extent to which you know, we, we can't talk about client confidentiality issues, but we, we have a number of ways of getting information on, on a project. Okay? What we're then interested in is at the asset level, you know, the location is, is, is everything, very, very critical. Um, we sort of run the screening. We can, you know, we, we can, we can make a kind of a, a best judgment at that point as to levels of comfort. Uh, but then we get into the due diligence directly with a company, and we don't have a template approach. We're interested in you know, what, I, what I call the four C's: um, the commitment of the company, what are their internal controls, uh, what kind of capacity do they have in terms of human resourcing, in terms of staffing, in terms of the expertise. Uh, what kind of systems and procedures do they have to translate that commitment? The capacity piece is, is, is critical. It's by far the most important part. Um, then we're looking for the credibility. You know, what sort of performance indicators do they have? What kind of story can they share with us? Um, and we, we will look at that. Um, and then ultimately the, the fourth thing would be the communications. So you know, we, we're looking for this whole cycle. Um, if we feel the need to bring in a third party consultant, then we would do so. We wouldn't do it in all cases. Um, again, we may do quite a lot of repeat business with the same clients or the same sorts of clients or in the same sorts of locations. So we'll already have quite a good knowledge base on the issues by, you know, at a, at a provincial level or regency level, for example, in a country like Indonesia. Um, we do, just to touch perhaps on oil palm as an example, we, we do have uh, particular requirements as a, an RSPO member ourselves. We require that our clients are RSPO, or that they commit to becoming RSPO members. Uh, we think you know, th this, is, this is quite easy. Um, we might get a little resistance at that point, uh, but becoming a member is, is, is relatively straightforward. There's not, a, there's not much of a, a benchmark to entry. Um, we require over time as well that our clients will develop a roadmap towards certification. Um, this, is, this is more important. Uh, we've, we've you know, we do have situations where clients have then come to us and said, look, we don't quite know what to do on this. So, you know, we can also push that risk into a bit of an opportunity space as well, where we can work with a consultant who we would engage, we would help to write the scope of work for the consultant who would then go and provide that service to us, but also to a client. So that's the, that's the kind of framework using oil palm as an example. Mm -hmm. Does it? Does and, that and, do and, well, so, do you have cases where, where companies back away, back away or back out of the, they don't go for certification or they say, yep. we know we committed to this, but we've decided it's too much for us, we're not going to do it. Does that, does that put in jeopardy your investment in that company or does it, does it trigger anything with you? Is it, is it a breach of, of agreement or something? Um, we do have these requirements in, in contractual arrangements. Um, you know, without getting into the specifics, yeah, we, we, we have had situations where a client has said, you know, we, we, we can't do this, 
maybe because, you know, the, the reasons I, I, I couldn't get into. Um, they know our requirement. Sometimes there's a little, we, we need to be a little bit flexible in terms of understanding why not. Um, as a priority, rather than disengage with the client, we'd like to engage and understand because mm -hmm. quite often it comes down again to the capacity issue. Mm -hmm. So we also need to be quite careful that we are not putting unrealistic expectations, you know, a sort of short-term horizon onto a client yeah. that simply doesn't have the, have, have the capacity. But we, we have had clients who we felt, you know, they, they just can't get there. Um, and in, in cases, you know, we haven't been able to, uh, to proceed with the business. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just a final question, is this, is it, are these lessons more broadly applicable, or, or is, it a, is it large banks like Credit Suisse that can implement this, or can some, some of the smaller banks implement these types of sustainability? Can they in, you know, work with, with, say, smaller or medium-sized uh, enterprises to implement these types of sustainability applications? What are the big lessons yeah. that, you, that you're learning that are more broadly applicable across the industry? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, Credit Suisse is a private sector financial institution, so you know, we, we, we don't generally deal with small businesses, so there's a certain scale which is relevant to an international bank. Um, the challenge on the capacity, though, is, is, is a very important one. So the larger clients that we deal with, they would already have the basis of this capacity. I think for some of the, the SMEs, this is going to become straight away a challenge, mm -hmm. I, I think, inevitably. Um, I think also for some of the, the, the local and the regional banks, they will also have the capacity challenges. Um, you know, I can knock up a good forestry policy for you in 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's the capacity piece. It's right. who owns it. Where's the accountability? What mechanisms do you have in place to start delivering on that? And I would almost say policy is policy. It's, it's nice, but well, you've got to get beyond policy for it to really mean anything. Um, I would say also, just you know, using RSPO as an example, there's still a relatively small number of private sector financial institutions that are members of RSPO. Mm -hmm. um, we do have you know, an, an ambition to get more local regional banks involved. And where they don't have the capacity, and we, we understand that could be the case, we'd like to lend them our capacity. Mm -hmm. Because you know, we, we'd like to encourage and to make the environment as conducive as possible for them to start to engage. And then they can start to spread the message with their clients. So mm -hmm. you know, the, the opportunity is, 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 is great. I think you know, the risks are clear. But there's increasingly an opportunity, and we think the time is is now to you know try and leverage on this. Okay, thank you, um, Glenn. I'd like to, to 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 follow up on some points with you. Um, you, you talk about uh, delinking productivity at, uh, uh, or de delinking agricultural productivity and deforestation, um, and and in recent years, more and more companies are joining these pledges for sustainability um, and zero deforestation and things like that. Um, it seems, could you maybe comment on, on, on this point that we were just beginning to, to address? What is the opportunity for small and medium-sized enterprises to, to, to get involved? Or is it only really the big players that, that can get involved in these types of, of things? And, and you know, have you been advising small and medium-sized enterprises? And, and, and what sorts of steps can these enterprises begin to take towards uh, these sustainability well, I, I think to be, you know, to be certain, a lot of the progress has started with the big companies. And we should also say there's a lot, uh, there remains a huge amount of need for big companies to take action. Um, you know, I think we've seen since the Wilmar announcement, uh, about a dozen major consumer companies have announced no deforestation commitments. Uh, and that's, that's great. And I think that's driving change down the supply chain, including to small and medium enterprises and to smallholders. Um, you know, when we look at what's happening with Wilmar's implementation, uh, they have more than 400 suppliers. Some of them are really big companies and some of them are, are significantly smaller and they have a lot of smallholders in their supply chain, which is pretty common amongst uh, palm oil companies as well as others. Uh, one of the positive things about having a company like that that's so committed to uh, realizing their commitment is that they uh, are, have really become an extension service to uh, spread no deforestation commitments down the supply chain. It requires going out into the field, meeting with literally hundreds of uh, suppliers, talking them through it. They've been working with the Forest Trust to implement the agreement, and they're able to bring expertise to those companies that can help. Um, one of the things that's been really great to have, both with Wilmar and a lot of the other private sector commitments, uh, the Norwegian government has been very supportive of uh, Indonesia, in particular's transition um, away from deforestation as an economic model and they've been offering to provide technical support and also other incentives to help smallholders in particular transition to deforestation-free production. 
One, one area that we've focused on, and just to, to get back to Ben's point, is we have, um, you know, I think there has been incredible progress at the trader level. There's more that needs to happen with companies like IOI, Lotus Kirkland, and Bungie. Um, and there, as a result, through the supply chain, through producers, you're starting to see progress. There's great progress at the consumer level. We found that the financial sector is really lagging um, in terms of its commitment to, to um, make finance more sustainable. So. Uh, there is some change happening there, though, um, and what we've tried to do, and, and this is uh, through our chain reaction research project, is we are providing very in-depth information on sustainability performance of specific palm oil and pulp and paper producers to investors, to analysis, analysts, based on our, our network of um, researchers on the ground in, in Southeast Asia and elsewhere, uh, as well as satellite analysis. And we're getting a really positive feedback from banks uh, and others because they, they frankly, you know, either don't have the capacity or in some cases don't have the interest to go and ask the questions. They re rely a lot on what uh, the companies are telling them, so there's a lot of self-reporting. Uh, and they also rely, in our view, excessively on, on certification, particularly in the case of the RSPO, which unfortunately has rejected efforts by its members to uh, make sure that it, it doesn't certify destruction of high carbon stock forests or peatlands. Um, and so one of the things that's been happening in the industry is that you're seeing, you know, I think banks and financial institutions really want to have certification as a benchmark and a kind of checkoff, and it can be really helpful. Unfortunately, in tropical forests in Southeast Asia, some of the certification bodies just frankly aren't working. They aren't delivering the values that, uh, or the reputational guarantees that financial institutions are seeking. And as a result, it re is, re is requiring a sort of, you know, a new uh, means of delivering those values and specifically doing due diligence. So, you know, we're trying to address that through the Chain Reaction Research Project, but um, it also requires cooperation of banks. And, you know, we are seeing some of them start to go to their supply, to, to the, their clients and say, we're not going to provide financial services unless you meet these benchmarks. Um, BNP Paribas has been a, a leader in this regard um, and has actually, some of the recent commitments have come uh, in part because BNP Paribas, institutional investors around the world and others have said, you know, frankly, we're not going to invest in you or we're not going to provide financial services unless you adopt a no deforestation policy. Okay. So are there some certification processes that are working really well that can serve as a lesson for, 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 for these ones that aren't delivering? Um, I, you know, I think there's some that are certainly better than others. So, you know, I think FSC certified for, actually, you know, its own, where, where it's actually certifying a managed forest is definitely stronger than RSPO. Um, there's been some studies, you know, that I think the Nature Conservancy has done that I saw presented earlier showing that, you know, some, on, some FSC certified lands in, in Southeast Asia, um, you're not actually seeing significantly higher carbon stock conservation. I think what that shows is that you know, certification can be a valuable tool to deliver on a company's values or whatever it is that they're trying to achieve, but they can't just kind of blindly rely on certification. They need to make sure, you know, do the due diligence to make sure that they can go out and, and find out that they're either their suppliers or their clients are actually meeting the standards that they expect. The, the good thing for companies at this point is that it's becoming a lot easier. Because you have large companies like Wilmar, like APP, like Golden Agri Resources, um, actually, you know, going out there quite aggressively and talking to their suppliers and providing extension service, and you have institutions like TFT, that the, it doesn't always require, you know, a huge investment of time or capital to do it. It requires a little bit, um, but increasingly that's the expectation that, you know, the public, regulators, and others have. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move on, uh, Mauricio, to talk a little bit about uh, some, of the, some of the work that you've been doing. Um, with Monsanto, I know Monsanto has a very strong um, uh, corporate social responsibility uh, set of actions. They're, they're doing a lot of work on the ground. Can you talk a bit about how you're, you're integrating some of these experiences into your business model? You talked about uh, uh, producing more and conserving more at the same time, but oftentimes producing more means conserving less because you, cre you create more economically viable or more economically lucrative land use systems that then, then work against conservation. Can you talk a bit about the, this trade-off between intensifying agriculture and making more profitable systems and, and the, the, this, uh, this intention to increase conservation as well? Yeah. So, so just to give you a little bit of an idea, and uh, there, there's a project that we've um, been working in, in Brazil for the last couple of years, probably five years, 
And specific to, to your question, where we have uh, done a big effort of uh, helping farmers to uh, increase their yields and produce more within their fields. But yes, that obviously poses the question of now that they are more profitable, they would want to open more land in the forest. So, so the program, uh, and um, it's a program that we are starting to, to work here as well in, in Indonesia or Sumatra. But the, the, the program what it's doing is on one side is training the farmers and giving them the technological tools to provide more yields and increase their productivity. But there's also a very significant effort working both with the government and local agencies in educating uh, the communities in terms of the value of those forests and of those areas that uh, need to be conserved. So it's a push in both ways. It's a push in uh, you know, make, helping and supporting governments to create the right legislation uh, going towards education and making sure those communities understand and uh, know what's the value of uh, maintaining those hectares of forest and then at the same time gaining the profits from their own land due to these technologies that were coming. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I, I guess in Brazil I can see, see that working fairly well. There, there's, uh, uh, I mean, in, in the Amazon there, there's fairly strong uh, governance or stronger governance uh, than, than we have in many places here in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, how much of a role is, is governance in, in controlling, uh, or not, not, not so much controlling, but, but maintaining that, that there's a rational use of land in the landscape so that, that pro appropriate land uses are allocated to appropriate parts of, of land? And how much does you as the private sector get involved with local government agencies where you're introducing the, these, these more intensive and, 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 and lucrative um, land uses, how, how engaged do you get, get with them in, in for, as far as land use planning and, and regulation of land use? So, so I would say there, there's two pieces to the story. So one of the key pieces of that governance is obviously the government setting up policy that restrains and then how do they are able to control that at the local level. But then on the other hand, the, that piece of governance is also uh, you know, working with the government in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, as people are more profitable within their land and they also understand the value of conserving the forest that, uh, that, that creates own governance, you know, like self-conscious in terms of not going in that direction. So in terms of uh, Indonesia, the communities where we're working, uh, you know, small farmers, uh, we're really stretching them to move from very, very low yields of varietal corn probably to uh, higher yielding products that we'll do two or three times yields. And uh, for now, you know, in the meantime, while we work at the next four or five years with them, uh, that will provide them uh, income to be able to more, more than open for new land, really get productive on their land. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, the next challenge is going to be how we get them to stay in where they are and make productive what they really have and not go over to, to the new area. So it's going to be challenging. I wouldn't say it's not, but uh, mm -hmm. it's part of what we're working on. It's really happening and it's uh, some, you know, it's part of the pilot test we're starting to run so that then we can do this on a bigger scale. Okay, yeah. thank you. Tina, I'd like to, to, to come back to some of your, um, the points that you made about uh, increasing smallholder uh, productivity by 50%. Um, biodiversity uh, increasing, uh, I'm sorry, rehabilitation of degraded land, it, it was 10 billion hectares, it's quite ambitious, um, and, and a 20% more efficiency with respect to crops. Um, a lot of what Syngenta does is, is increasing agricultural productivity through, through rather sophisticated um, approaches and technologies. Um, how does this fit into to Southeast Asian models where, where we have large farms and, and small, very, very variable size farms with, with uh, you know, small, small family farms to, 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 to medium-sized enterprises. Um, and how do you ensure that smallholders don't get squeezed out in, in, in this intensification process? Mm -hmm. So in terms of um, the variety of different customers that we work with across Southeast Asia, the majority, in fact, would be smallholders. So this very much speaks to our goal around empowering smallholders and increasing their productivity. One of the very practical examples that I could share with you is, is linked to rice, um, as shown in this picture, which is around um, our Grow More protocol, which is all about equipping farmers with the right um, technologies to be used at the right time to get the best results. 
So we break the crop into four very pragmatic stages and we make sure that we are able to, through the appropriate education, um, ensure that farmers are clear and confident about how to use these technologies in order to get the best results. The very real aspect around this is that the improvement we can see within one season for rice farmers, um, such as the smallholder behind us, would be increases of between 20 or 30 percent in terms of yield, not necessarily using any more technologies, just using them better at the right time to get the best results. So absolutely, um, modern technologies make a very real difference in a smallholder farming context, and we're, we're very much committed to that. Um, in terms of ensuring smallholders don't miss out, I think once you've actually increased yields, one of the big challenges is who do you sell it to? How are you going to actually make an incremental profit for your family as a result of having generated a higher yield? And this is where I think it speaks again to collaborations across the value chain, both in, both in terms of access to markets as well as in financing opportunities that have been spoken about by some of the other panel, panel today, which in, in, ensure that farmers have the opportunity to access these technologies in affordable ways. So, Financing education and access to markets are some of the key ways we make sure that smallholders don't, don't miss out. Okay. And, and if I could just ask a little bit, I mean, we, we, we know that agriculture creates a lot of off-site negative impacts, uh, nutrient loading of surface waters, for example. What, what do you do beyond the individual field to, to, to work on farming systems or, or, or farming landscapes to try and reduce some of these negative off-site impacts, whether it be greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere through nitrous oxide or, or or, or this, you know, um, nitrates in, in groundwater or, or, or nutrient loading in surface waters. Mm -hmm. Are the things that you do at the landscape scale to work with the farmers to reduce some of these negative off-site impacts? I think we do both. So we work first with the individual farmers because ultimately it's pockets of land that aggregate to make major ecosystems. And we make sure that we're providing, um, together with agricultural extension services, pragmatic and sustainable agricultural um, practices, whether that's around nutrition management, around water, or around cropping practices. So that's the first thing that we do. The second is very much linked to the whole biodiversity goal, so land reclamation. So the more that we can do to ensure that land doesn't go out of production through poor agricultural practices, and therefore that we're not encroaching on forests um, and other ecosystems that surround agricultural land, we believe we can make a significant difference, and that's our key area of focus. Okay, thank you. Um, finally, I'd like to move on to, to, to Felia Salim and, and um, ask you a bit about uh, some of the, the, the new banking regulation that there is here in, in Indonesia mm -hmm. um, that uh, recently introduced that, that says that banks should consider sustainable practices yeah. when giving out loans. Yeah. We'd like to get your experience. What does this mean in practice? You know, um, what are financial and social environmental criteria for sustainability? How, how do you implement it? Do, do you have criteria for sustainability? Do you monitor them? Do you, do you, do you weigh them in, 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 as you evaluate projects? Can you just give us a little bit of a, uh, an explanation of what your experience is in, in implementing this, this regulation? Yeah. Um, the Central Bank has issued uh, a regulation about uh, requiring, requiring, requiring sustainability. But uh, to date, there's no clear guideline. Uh, it's still voluntary in, na in nature because it doesn't give more specifics. And it's left to uh, the market to, to figure out what are some of those criteria. In my earlier opening statement is, I wish uh, the, the market players would know which measure should be, uh, should be utilized. Uh, of course, we, some of the larger companies uh, is quite clear, some of the global players are quite clear, RSPO and then there's uh, the Unilever taking uh, uh, a leading role in that. So that guideline is quite clear. But when it comes to going down the value chain ladder, this is where some of the challenges we, we see. And uh, the, the environmental, social, and risk assessment, there are broad, uh, broad guidelines that we ourselves uh, require. But that's, this, this needs to be complemented with the actual uh, certification criteria, let's say in oil and gas or in coal.
those self-risk assessment. So it's, it's to, com to complement. Uh, so these are what we use. On the larger companies, obviously, because they have a market to sell to, they use independent assessors. So that, that the problem is not there because they will, it, it will take care of themselves because the market requires for them to, to, uh, to do so, so that they can, they can sell to the market. But the challenge, obviously, is to get the guidelines, the, the complementing, uh, implementing regulation for some of the smaller players, the medium to smaller size players. Um, there are a lot of, quite a lot of initiatives that we are engaged with, some of the international agencies. But then again, the hurdle that we still see is um, that it's still a costly process, that ultimately it's about incentivizing the market players to, to, uh, to utilize these criteria setting. So I think in the medium to small size players, it's still at very much at a, not an infant stage, but a learning process. And that needs to, to have a clearer intervention so that banks like us can include that and complement and enhance our criteria setting. It has to come from the industries themselves. And at this point, uh, I see value in, in uh, a lot of parties, including perhaps uh, governments incentivizing so that the cost, somebody needs to pay for the cost of education. Uh, this is where uh, it perhaps needs uh, more attention. So, so the uh, criteria that we implement internally can be enhanced as we, as we progress. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we started this session a little bit late, so I think we're a little squeezed for time, and I've been asked to, to wrap this up, so we're not going to be able to have time for questions, I'm afraid, uh, which I think is unfortunate and disappointing, but uh, it's, it's that or you go to the cocktail very late this evening. Um, so I think we're going to wrap it up. I'd really like to thank all of the, the, the private sector representatives who, who uh, agreed to come on this panel and, and talk about the lessons that they're learning. The, these are companies that are on the, on the front lines learning the hard lessons and, and, and trying to, to move their industry forward. Um, I think they're, they're, they, we, we talk very frankly about the challenges that they're facing and I, I really appreciate the candor and, and your, your willingness to, to, to discuss these openly. Um, and so I'd like to give them all a round of applause and, and thank you all very much for, for this session.